Welcome to Upstream, where we make your worldview bigger and older by taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. Author and tech entrepreneur Antonio Garcia Martinez once said that the Western mind is like a tuning fork calibrated for one frequency, the Christ story. Hit it with the right Christ figure and it'll just hum deafeningly in response. That's a surprising claim when you look at the statistics. Lifeway Research just reported that only 31% of Americans have strong confidence in the church and organized religion. And the share of Americans who consider themselves Christian today is at an all-time low. Yet my guest now agrees with Martinez that the entire West, even countries that are more secular than America, are still in some important ways profoundly Christian. The moral fervor behind social justice movements, campaigns for equal rights, and advocacy for victims and the oppressed sets us utterly apart from the majority of people for the majority of human history. As it turns out, our pretense of having moved beyond Christian faith may only be possible because that faith, like air, is invisible to us, but we still breathe it. Glenn Scrivener is an author, speaker, and filmmaker, and director of the charity Speak Life. I first encountered his work through his remarkable spoken word poetry on YouTube, including my favorite, which was about the King James Bible and the phrases we get from it. He's continued to use his talent with words by writing a powerful new book. It's called The Air We Breathe, How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress, and Equality. And that's what we want to talk about today on the show. Glenn, welcome to Upstream. Thanks so much for having me. Tell me now, how is it that you can hear those statistics that I just quoted from Lifeway and elsewhere and still claim that Christianity is the air we breathe? I mean, that, that's a big claim. Well, I guess you've got to ask the question, by what standard are people judging the church and finding it wanting? And the standards that people use, by and large, very Christian or Christian-ish, really. At the heart of my book, I talk about seven different values that have come to us uniquely through the, the Jesus Revolution. And they're things like equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. And the way you realize that these things have become highest values is just by reversing them. And you you ask yourself, what what is it to encounter something that is unequal, cruel, coercive, unenlightened, anti-science, regressive, and restrictive? What would you call such a thing? Well, that's the worst. Why is it the worst? Because we know what the best is. And, and yet, what is it that we tend to find to be coercive and restrictive and anti-science and anti-enlightenment? Anti well, we tend to call the church those things. Why do we call the church those things? Because we're children of the revolution and all children end up embarrassed by their parents and end up holding them to certain standards. But the, the standards by which we judge the church and find it wanting are uniquely and particularly Christian. It's a big claim, I know, and I take a whole book to unpack it, but that's the contention. You open it with this sort of reminder that we think of these things as self-evident. You know, you refer to the Declaration of Independence, of course, where Thomas Jefferson famously writes that we hold these truths to be self-evident. And the first of those is that all men are created equal, right? And much like another author that I've really enjoyed, Tom Holland, who I interviewed about two years ago now on the program, um, in his book, Dominion, he claims that these truths, especially equality, are nothing of the sort. They are not at all self-evident if you look at them historically. How did we come to think of them, though, as self-evident? Why is it true, as you say, that you know Thomas Jefferson's statement works if you italicize we? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Why do we? Yeah. Well, Tom Holland will tell you that the seedbed for the whole thing is the book of Genesis. And he, he says that very boldly in Dominion, which I think is a, a fantastic book and was part of the inspiration for, for my book. And if equal human rights are so self-evident, Thomas Jefferson, how come you and your guys are the only people who seem to have known about such things? Because Plato and Aristotle did not find these things self-evident. I mean, self-evident truths are things like all triangles have three sides and all bachelors are unmarried. Like that, That's usually the thing that we put into the category self-evident. The idea that every single human being has an equal moral dignity and worth 
if it's self-evident, why have some of the greatest thinkers and moralists in mankind not known about it? If you want to think about something that's more self-evident to human civilization, slavery has a much better right to be considered something that's self-evident because it's, it's kind of a human universal. Every society that's got to a certain size has had institutions that enforce radical inequality in people. I mean, Jefferson is just clearly wrong <laughs> um, if you just do a bit of, you know, comparative anthropology. The contention that, you know, we're all equal is so far from self-evident. It seems that it, it actually contradicts what are the self-evident truths, which if you look at mankind from a, a purely naturalistic perspective, you know, we are very much unequal. We're not all the same height. We're not all the same strength. We're not all the same intelligence. We're not all, we can't all run as fast. You know, we don't all make as much money. We don't even look the same. So there, there are just inequalities and differences that like difference is the self-evident truth of humanity. And for, and for most of history, and this is what moderns don't seem to realize in the West, that was codified and recognized in institutions. I love this phrase that you, you bring in. And this is one of your great talents is like turning a phrase and making it memorable. So you do this so much in the book with alliteration and just like memorable references. And one of my favorite is you refer to the night before Christmas. From a believer's point of view, there was a long night before Christmas. Christmas, of course, being the birth of, of Jesus. Talk to us about what that looks like. Put the Christian revolution for us in historical context, because things looked different in the Greco-Roman world, for instance. So imagine a dinner party in which you've got Thomas Jefferson to the right of you and you've got Plato to the left of you and you try to get them talking about, you know, self-evident moral truths. And as soon as Jefferson starts like talking about inalienable rights or unalienable, as, as he put it, or, or you know, the, the moral equality of, of each individual, Plato, his, his eyebrows would be raised at that point and... If he's being polite, he would say, well, tell, tell me more about this thing because you seem to really believe in it, but I see no evidence. What Plato saw evidence of and what he said nature teaches you is the inequality of all people. So you take any two people and you measure them by any one metric and you get difference. You know, this guy is stronger than that guy and this guy is smarter than that guy and this guy has more money than that guy. This guy is a higher social class than that guy. This guy is more e economically profitable than that guy. By every measurement you make, you're seeing difference. And if you just want to think about it biologically, I mean, absolutely natural selection depends on difference. Difference is the driver. And really, you know, Many, many centuries you know, prior to Darwin, Plato was teaching you something similar that written into, woven into, baked into the fabric of the cosmos is a vertiginously steep hierarchy of being with the gods at the top and the slaves at the bottom. And so much of the ancient wisdom was about just knowing your place within that great hierarchy of being. And so justice was a, a huge concern for the Platos and the Aristotles of, of the ancient world. They were absolutely concerned for justice, but justice was the enforcement of the inequalities that were baked into the nature of the cosmos. For us, I mean, it just, it just shows what a revolution has taken place. For us, justice is about equalizing people. And the Platos of this world are, are like, well, where is this magical realm? in which equality exists. Because if you just live by your, your senses, and if you just live by reason, then you are going to notice the inequality in this world, and perhaps morally, you will want to enforce that inequality. And yet our instincts are exactly the reverse of that. Where do we get that idea from? Well, you know, Christ comes into this world, and he claims to be the word of the father, co-equal with the most high, the one at the top of the hierarchy of being, who nevertheless descends right to the bottom to die the death of a slave, and then to invite us into his family, into a family in which nobody is a lord except he, and we're all brother and sister, equal with one another, one in Christ. And all of a sudden, he reverses the way of nature, because nature is the survival of the fittest and the sacrifice of the weakest. And now in the cross, it's fittest to sacrifice for we the weakest, so that we the weakest might survive, and more than survive, thrive, and invite others into this spiritual unity. 
That is the revolution that's totally upended everything, such that what is self-evident to a Thomas Jefferson is a nonsense to a Plato. Why is that? Well, we have beliefs, beliefs that have been shaped by the Jesus revolution and that now seem obvious. They now seem natural. They now seem universal, but they are nothing of the sort. And so in the book, I'm constantly trying to take us out of our kind of Western mindset and either, you know, put us in a non-Christian culture or a pre-Christian culture to make us see again how weird we all are. And when you see how weird we are, you think something happened. What is that something? I say it's Christianity. Weird is actually used as an acronym in the book. Give us what that stands for. Joseph Henrik, an evolutionary biologist uh, at Harvard University, he coined this acronym along with uh, a few other researchers back in the uh, 2000s. It stands for W, uh, Western E, uh, educated, I, industrialized, R, rich, and D, democratic. We are weird. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And his whole point, he's he's written a, a big fat book called The Weirdest People in the World about Westerners. He kind of notices that all our sociological and psychological experiments that we do are, tend to be university students who, you know, if you offer them a slice of pizza, they'll, they'll do your silly little psychological you know, <laughs> test for you. They'll be part of your little study. And yet, overwhelmingly, it is like American 20-year-olds who are being tested on. And for many, many years, psychologists kind of thought that our kind of brains are the natural human brain. And we've recognized, no, we are weird. We're incredibly weird. That Our individualism is weird. Our analytic kind of thinking is weird. There's so much about us that has totally been shaped by contingent cultural factors. Now, Joseph Henrik wants to ask the question, what is it that has shaped the weirdness of the West? And absolutely, it is Christianity, without a shadow of a doubt for Joseph Henrik, evolutionary biologist at Harvard University. It is Christianity. And in particular, as an evolutionary biologist, he wants to think, why has Christianity shaped us? Well, he's going to look at the marriage and family program, as he calls it, of Christianity, the particular sexual ethic that developed from the first centuries forwards and particularly was kind of elucidated and, and tightened up during the, the medieval period. But for him, the reason why we are so weird is absolutely Christianity. Interestingly, he thinks the the specific sexual ethic of Christianity has shaped the world in really interesting ways. And I press into that in my chapter on the sexual revolution of the first few centuries, a, a chapter on consent. But yeah, we're totally weird. And it's not controversial to say that the reason why we think so differently to the rest of the world and the rest of history is Christianity. That's, that is not a controversial claim. I'm, I'm just bringing it to a pop- popular audience. It's so startling too, when you gain this historical consciousness, you realize how weird we are, you realize what the world before Christ looked like, and you, were, and you realize how much the cross upended everything. I mean, you point this out in numerous ways that even surprised me. It's just sort of an, oh, it's an aha moment. The light bulb comes on in your head. You think you you talk about walking through uh, an art gallery with paintings and, you know, you'll get to that wing inevitably where, where, where the educated art aficionado will, will look at these paintings, rows of paintings of the crucifixion or crosses and, and say, ah, sacred art. Well, what's literally being depicted there? (laughs) It's a, it's torture. It's death by torture. One of the most monstrous forms of execution ever devised. And yet we look at it with these serene expressions and we say, ah, sacred art. This is about religion and, and divine things and heavenly things and, and love. How does that sort of thing happen? I mean, that, that is the magnitude of the Christian revolution. What you point to is that one of the earliest depictions of Jesus on the cross may be the earliest depiction. It's not actually a Christian who drew it. It was a, it was a Roman, some anonymous person who wanted to scorn Christianity. And it's Jesus nailed to the cross with an ass's head, with a donkey up there. And it depicts the, you know, across the centuries, like you say, very well, the attitude of of the Greco-Roman mind, the pagan mind toward Christianity. It's this guy is an ass. This guy is an idiot. He got himself nailed to a cross. He got to the bottom of the social hierarchy and died. And that was that. But for some reason, he's now the most important man in the history of the world. That's a miracle. I mean, it's astonishing. And we don't even remember that it happened in many ways because we just adopted the values of that itinerant carpenter who was killed. 
Yeah. Yeah. We went to Rome in December and we, we shot a little documentary called Easter Uprising. It's all about how the, the, the weekend at Easter has totally shaped our world. That, that is the real revolution, the real uprising that is, has shaped our world. And you know, like three locations in particular leap out to me in Rome. We went to the Colosseum. And amazingly, even after doing all this research for the book, I go to the Colosseum and I look at all the different implements of torture and you see like the brutality the bloodlust of you know 60,000 people crammed into the Colosseum to watch people being torn limb from limb and the ingenuity of the ways in which people would be would be murdered for sport for entertainment was uh, extraordinary but then as you make your way around in the tour you come past this giant cross at one end of the Colosseum and my first thought, even after doing all the research for this book, my first thought after seeing that cross was, oh, I guess the Roman Catholic Church smuggled in a religious symbol. <laughs> you <No>. know, <laughs> what an idiot I am. What an idiot. Like, but genuinely, my, fir- my first thought was, okay, they've, they've, they're somehow intimating the, the Christian revolution that, that took place after the Colosseum. Like, no, you idiot. This was part of the entertainment. This was part of the death by torture. And within the gladiatorial games, you want fast deaths and slow deaths. You want to mix it up a little bit. And, and so you, you would have your more kind of grotesque, macabre deaths happening, but dotted around the edge of the arena, you'd have maybe dozens of people on crosses, like slowly gasping their last breath. And that was just one more implement of torture, one more method of execution. And it's just extraordinary that the cross has become a symbol of God's presence in suffering, you know, God's peace amidst the pain that even in its true context of, you know, brutality, it still holds the resonance that it now has to us because Christ has transformed not just that brutality, but kind of all brutality because he is the God who enters into that suffering in order to, to rise up again and give, give hope. So that, that was the Colosseum. And then the next place we went to was the, uh, the Palatine Hill Museum, which is where the Alex Amanos graffiti is that you just mentioned. And what I love about the Alex Amanos graffiti is it's got this figure of a, of a donkey on the cross and next to it, there's this bozo, this total moron raising his hand in veneration. He's, he's called Alex Amanos and the caption just says, Alex Amanos worships his God. <laughs> it's just so spiteful. It's just so, and, and you can really, you can hear the spite and it's deliciously satirical and, and it still works 2000 years later to, to experience what it's like for a Roman to hear Christian preaching. To hear a Christian say, oh yeah, our God is not like Thor or Zeus. Our, our, our God, you know, our, our God is not like Mars. Our God is not just one more deity among the pantheon, but, but the Lord of all. And he descended to, to, to be tortured on that cross to death. It's just a nonsense, a grotesque kind of a nonsense. Very perverse. And yet somehow it's won the day because like the next place we visit in Rome is St. Peter's and <laughs> it's got like, the biggest church in the world built in the shape of a cross with crosses everywhere and everyone's crossing themselves. <laughs> it's like, what happened? What on earth happened to go from the Colosseum to the first preaching of the cross that strikes people like Alex Amanos to then Christianity just taking over the world and the cross having such an extraordinary effect on people. And it is just that thing of... In an unequal world, suddenly the highest stoops to the lowest place to invite us to his table. In a cruel world, Christ comes to die for the weak and the poor. In a coercive world that does not believe in consent, here is Christ volunteering to be victim. In an unenlightened world, here is Christ coming as the light. And, and all, these, all these things, it's, it's, it's the most extraordinary revolution. And we just we are so blinded to it because it's been so successful. The, the reason you know that the Christian revolution has been so successful is you don't notice it. It's just the air we breathe, you know? Yeah. There, there is no Roman representation on offer today in, in terms of Western political discourse or social discourse. Nobody's arguing for the, we should, you know, have public torture as entertainment and expose our infants and, 
you know, use slaves and women and, and, and children and so forth for sexual gratification. These were unquestioned practices that even the great philosophers of the day were sort of endorsing as normal and natural and self-evident. And yet now that's not even an option at the table. No one's even arguing for that seriously in the West anymore. So this is what I think your book contributes and why it's so valuable. And I think it's also what, what's sets it apart from other books that address some similar subject matter. It's that this is an extremely accessible number one. This is not, you know, dominion. <laughs> this is, it, you don't get lost in the historical weeds as much as some of the, some of the other writers do. Which is beautifully written dominion. And, and I, I do recommend if people, if people want to go further, then it's, it's a really fascinating read, but yeah. 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 But, but this book, you know, brings readers of different sorts. In fact, you have three categories of readers, which was very helpful. In, into confrontation with this revolution that took place to to help them realize okay i don't i don't know if you believe this or if you're indifferent to this or if you're ab, you know you're openly averse to it you're actually now you consider yourself an, a non-christian vehemently opposed to christianity you still need to reckon with the magnitude of the revolution that has taken place here so much that the moral values you cherish and believe in are actually distinctively Christian values contributed by the Christian God and his followers. And if you don't recognize that you're standing out in thin air, you have no foundation to work with. So from this point here, we're, you know, 20 minutes in, I want to get into the actual values you deal with, because we can pick and choose a little bit here and there, because there's so much in each chapter, but give us an overview of the values, the weird values that we've all embraced, that no matter what our stance toward Christianity as a religion, we all kind of just agree are good. I go for seven, because it's a great Christian number, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> if I had six, it would just feel incomplete, right? And the, and the seven kind of map onto seven different epochs that I trace through. So I go from Old Testament, New Testament, early church, medieval period, scientific revolution, abolition of the slave trade, and then through into the modern period. Those are the seven epochs and mapped onto those seven epochs. I've got equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. And I could have picked more and some of them are more contentious than others. I guess progress. Um, some people, uh, some people don't believe in progress at all. Most people I, I do though have an unthought through sort of belief in progress. But what I want to do is just point to the fact that our, our friends are believers already. And I just refuse. I refuse the category of someone who just thinks that they, they go by reason and evidence and logic because Nobody lives that way. No, nobody treats other people as though they are just mischievous apes. They, they really don't. And my, certainly my friends don't. Okay? And yet they don't think of themselves as, as, as believers. And yet, so I just want to say, look, with equality, do you believe that every member of society is of an equal moral value to every other, no matter their race, religion, creed, whatever? we're equal in that sense. And my friends will say, oh yeah, I believe that. But that's just obvious. That's natural. That's universal. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and if, if they've read through to about chapter two or three of my book, hopefully by that stage, they'll realize it's not obvious. It's not natural. It's not universal. They have a belief that is not grounded in reason or evidence, but it's deeply held. It's a pole star by which they navigate their lives. And some of my friends have given up on like, lucrative careers in order to serve and they 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 believe in this compassion stuff but they they can't do a mathematical equation that will prove it to you but but they don't think of themselves as believers and i and i really want to show them a you are totally a believer and b those beliefs have come to you from uniquely from jesus and you pull at the thread of compassion let's say and at the other end of that thread there is a man on a cross dying for you dying for even for his enemies I long for that to be a liberating kind of movement to A, embrace that I'm a believer, B, embrace that it's Jesus who has particularly shaped these kinds of beliefs, and, and then C, to see it makes so much more sense to believe in compassion when I believe in a person who is compassion, who is kindness, as Titus 3 calls Jesus. Titus 3 verse 4, kindness appeared in the incarnation it suddenly makes far more sense to believe not in the abstract value, but in the person who embodies these values. And that's, that's the journey that I want to take my non-Christian friends on. You're already a believer. 
that's been shaped by Jesus. And look, isn't it far more, isn't it far more believable? And doesn't it far more accord with your moral intuitions that these values do not come from abstract principles, but from a person himself? That's, that's the journey I try to t- take people on. You can see this religious belief and fervor when, you know, the wrong phrase gets used. So the example I really liked was the judge, I think over in the UK during the pandemic, who, who came to the conclusion in essence that some people are not equal to others with regard to like public policy. We got to make policy. And so we got to value the, the uh, well-being of the elderly who don't have much life left with the um, well-being of the young who need opportunities to get out there and educate themselves and have experiences. You can't lock them down for two or three years. It's literally going to destroy their sort of career. So people are not equal. And that were that, that phrasing really ticked people off. And so tell us that story of why it, cause that reaction. It was so spicy. And what's interesting is that Lord, Lord Sumption is this uh, Supreme Court judge in uh, the United Kingdom who is uh, who's now uh, retired, but he was a lockdown skeptic and he was brought on to explain why he thought that lockdown was a disproportionate response to the threats that coronavirus posed. And his argument was that, well, coronavirus mainly attacks the elderly and I'm elderly, said Lord Sumption. I think us old guys should have taken the burden of the virus because the burden of lockdown disproportionately affects the young. And my life is not equal. The life of the elderly is not equal to the life of the young people. And as soon as he said that, it was just, it was just like pouring kerosene onto a fire. And uh, Piers Morgan, you probably, he's, he's been over in the States, hasn't he? You, you know about Piers Morgan. He was oh, on yes. CNN for a while, wasn't he? he? He talks to us about gun control every couple of years. <laughs> yeah, Lectures right. at us is, is more the, the speed pouring of Pouring oil on troubled waters, Piers Morgan will, uh, yes, <laughs> with his ironic tone, uh, bringing, bringing piece. No, Piers Morgan sort of got involved and he managed to draw out of Lord Sumption, again, some some more very spicy comments where what Lord Sumption meant was, look, in healthcare economics, you do have to put a value actually on how many years are left in someone's life. And if if you've got a nine-year-old and a 109-year-old and you can only afford one life-saving treatment, Lord Sumption is saying, you know who to give the life-saving treatment to. And yet, even that we kind of, we recoil from, which we shouldn't recoil from that for any Darwinian reason, right? <laughs> and we shouldn't recoil from that, from the, the, the ethics of a Plato or an Aristotle. We, we recoil, and when, when we recoil from that, that is Christian revulsion we are feeling. And people would use the language, no, I think all lives are sacred no matter what lives are being lived. And everyone was using the language of s- sanctity, a kind of a vocabulary that they would never use really in, in, in normal conversation. And yet, when we start really drilling down into these values, we realize how religious they are and how actually, apart from Christianity, we have nothing really to fall back on, That's, which is why we just fall back on the language of it's, it's rights, it's equality, it's sanctity. <laughs> we, we kind of, at that stage, we're really clinging on by our fingernails because there's no logical reason. <laughs> why all people are equal. We really are digging down into, into visceral beliefs and they are religious, whether you've ever stepped foot inside a church or not, whether you've ever clapped eyes on the Bible or not. You are religious because you believe in the sanctity of life in that sense. You believe in equality in that sense. You believe in compassion in that sense. And I just really want to convince my so-called secular friends that their, their beliefs are religious in kind. And I'm seeing that work because I think we've come out of the new atheist period in which the Richard Dawkinses of this world seem to, to kind of carry the day in terms of the secular conversation and say, we're all post-Christian now. I think I'm finding with my non-Christian friends, they're, they're far more open to being told we're perhaps more in a post-secular age than in a post-Christian age. And there's an irreducible religious character to us that cannot just be slinked off because we're always going to want to talk about equality. We're always going to want to talk about consent and compassion and all these other values. So it's just, it's just with laser focus, taking my friends back to these, these values and saying, you're a believer too. One of the values that we come back to with extra strength and vehemence in our secular age, so-called secular age, is this value of consent. 
that you deal with. And so the, the picture that you paint and you, you quote other authors who do the same thing of the pre-Christian world is, uh, well, it's a very ugly picture. You know, it's a world in which, you know, I think it was, I think it was Tom Holland who originally put it that every orifice of every low class person is basically up for grabs for any powerful man who needs to relieve his sexual urges. That's, that's literally what was true in the ancient world and the, the Greco Roman world into which Christianity emerges. And, and now you fast forward to 2022 and you have, we're, we're in the aftermath of this enormous exposure of just abuse across industries and uh, institutions in, in politics, in Hollywood, in professional uh, athletics. All, all these men, have, powerful men have been sort of outed and their careers ended by revelations that they have taken advantage of those weaker than them either in terms of power or in terms of, you know, physical ability, and they have sexually abused them. This is the Me Too movement, you know. This is at issue is this whole idea of consent. And you bring in the story of, you know, Rachel Den Hollander, who's in the U.S. Olympics team and was abused repeatedly by Larry Nasser, who was a uh, who was a doctor on the team for many years. And yeah, yeah. she was an amateur athlete, but yeah, yeah. But, but she was treated by the, the team doctor for... Well, right, um, right, there you yeah, go. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she was one of these many victims and she has become a very vocal advocate for victims in the, in the wake of this. And she has this, this poignant question. She asks, what is a little girl worth? And this is what she actually first said at the, the trial, Nasser's sentence, I think it was a sentencing hearing. And the answer to that, that just sort of emerges from us, gutturally, you say, is that a little girl is worth everything. And yet nobody before Christianity would have thought that. Consent seems to me to be a spe- a, an especially powerful entry point into this discussion because of the intensity of our belief as modern people in consent, regardless of our faith. Yeah, completely. It's, it's important to say whenever um, issues of sexual abuse arise is that sometimes the church has been the very worst perpetrator of, of abuse in history. And sometimes the, the cover-ups have been as diabolical as the, the abuse itself. I want to say that there are two senses in which Christianity has brought abuse into the world. Firstly, and tragically and heinously, we have been perpetrators of abuse in this world, and that is inexcusable and horrific. But the second sense in which Christianity has brought abuse into the world is that we have brought the category of abuse into the world. Because What would you call a Harvey Weinstein who lived in Rome? Absolutely business as usual. Harvey Weinstein is tame, absolutely tame by Roman standards. What would you call a Jeffrey Epstein by Roman standards? Probably a senator. A senator, right, right. And of course, we have had senators and politicians that have been heinously abusive, but we have a category for that abuse. They have to keep that abuse secret. And that abuse is named as abuse, even as they live that double life. The trouble is, when you put that back in, the, in a Roman setting, there just is not a category in which that is seen as wrong. It is the Bible, it's bib- biblical categories that have, have given us the, the apparatus to look at that and to say that that is wrong. And so I, I talk about the sexual revolution. Usually when I say the phrase, the sexual revolution, everybody thinks about the swinging 60s. But historians like Kyle Harper, who wrote From Shame to Sin, which is just a tremendous book about the early centuries of the church and how it brought about a revolution in values as regards sexuality. Kyle Harper would say the real sexual revolution happened 1900 years before the swinging 60s. Or Joseph Henrik, who I've already mentioned, you know, he, you know, notes that in the Roman world, there are 25 Latin words for prostitutes. And at the same time, there is no way of naturally referring to an adult male virgin. If you say virgin in Latin, you're referring to a woman just by nature, right? Because there's just no category. There's, there's no category for chaste adult males. That's the kind of the, the, the sexual world in which pederasty is celebrated. Now, pederasty is usually an older male 
inducting usually a younger male into sexual life and the, the, the ways of sexuality. And it was absolutely celebrated by classical authors. And pederasty was just woven into the, the life of Romans and Greeks. They went about it slightly different, the Romans and the Greeks, but, but that was just a thing. And, and yet Christians and Jews called pederasty pedophoria. They gave it a different name. And pedophoria does not mean, pederasty means child love, right? Child love. Pedophoria means child destruction. So what the ancients called love, Christians called abuse. And when there were Christian emperors, they started to prosecute that abuse. And they started to even prosecute the abuse of masters could even be prosecuted for, for sexual crimes against their slaves, even decades after the abuse took place with no statute of limitations or anything like that. So suddenly Christianity was inventing, it was inventing childhood. I think it's a book by that title. Yes. Inventing childhood in, and, and it, it invents the, 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 the dignity of the victim really because Christ the lamb has been slain for us and we worship the lamb, the lamb at the center of the throne, the victim who was victimized for us. There, there is an honor and a dignity to victims within Christianity. There's an honor and dignity to children within Christianity. And there is, there is an absolute constraint on male sexuality that Jesus brings in places like Matthew 19 that was just it was just extraordinary. And people like Joseph Henrik say it, it is for the absolute flourishing of the world that male sexuality was completely constrained by the Jesus revolution, which was such good news for children who are being preyed upon, for wives who are being pray, preyed upon, for prostitutes, for, for slaves, for concubines, for, for all these things. The, the greatest sexual liberation the world has ever seen did indeed come about through the sexual revolution, but it was not the sexual revolution of the 1960s. It was, it was 1900 years earlier. And that book is The Invention of Childhood by Hugh Cunningham. I have not read it, but it's, it's going to be at the top of my list now because that sounds like a fascinating critique. I love what you do here as well. The, the, one of the strengths of this book is the openness and earnestness with which you acknowledge the guilt of Christians, like you just did with regard to you know, sexual abuse. So we, lots of things jump to mind. We've had a recent exposure of abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention. We've had, uh, obviously going back years and years, the Catholic sex abuse scandal. And this involved, you know, not just actual abuse, but the covering up of abuse to protect the institution and so forth. And the, I mean, this is, there's nothing to say about this other than that it's shameful, wicked, and, and you know, all those involved need to be brought to justice. The interesting part though is that we all agree this is a problem and your point is that christianity contributed the standards by which christian institutions and leaders are themselves today judged and it doesn't make sense to exact that kind of judgment whether it's on consent or on any other of these uh values that you celebrate and talk about in the book enlightenment for instance you know, it, do it doesn't make sense to sort of prosecute and condemn these vices unless you have a corresponding Christian virtue that has been introduced. And so your, your book really has this excellent critique of the church that doesn't, you know, doesn't try to hide from the fact that Christians themselves have been guilty of this. Talk to me about how you make that case in a tactful way that doesn't end up condemning Christianity itself, because I think you land very nicely. And I, I think a secular reader would have trouble in the end still saying, yep, Christianity is invalidated by the sins of Christians. Mm. Well, I quote Rachel Den Hollander. So in that victim impact statement that she made, she quotes C.S. Lewis, who says one of the reasons why he came to faith in theism, this wasn't part of his journey to, towards Christianity. He went from atheism to theism by looking at the problem of evil and recognizing that he thought of it as evil with a capital E. Well, if it's evil with a capital E, there must be good with a capital G. And he uses the analogy of the, the crooked line. If I see a crooked line, then I am implicitly saying that there is such a thing as straight lines. If there was no such thing as a straight line, nor would there be such a thing as a crooked line. Lines would just be lines. And if there's no such thing as ultimate righteousness, then there's also no such thing as wickedness. 
It's just stuff happens. People get unlucky. Folks get hurt. But what is wrong about sexual abuse, let's say? Well, you've got, you've got to believe that certain things are right. And you've got to have particular, you've got to have a particular doctrine of, okay, what is sex for? You've got to have a particular understanding of the sacredness of sex, the sacredness of bodies. You've got to say that sex is meaningful, that bodies are like temples. You've got to believe that power does not give you the right to trample over others' boundaries. You've got to believe that power actually ought to make you serve those without it. What an extraordinary thing to think. Why shouldn't the Harvey Weinsteins of this world get what they want to get. Why shouldn't the Jeffrey Epsteins of this world get what they want to get? There are not only beliefs about sex and the body that are involved in that. There are also beliefs about power and its proper use and about service and the greatness of service. And, and so, in order to really believe in the absolute wrongness of Larry Nassar, and I absolutely believe in the absolute wrongness of Larry Nassar, as does Rachel Van Hollander, you want to ensure that the crooked line is really seen as crooked. Well, okay, but it's only crooked if there's a straight line. And what is that straight line? That straight line is remarkably Christian. That straight line affirms things about the, the Jesus revolution and that first sexual revolution that's, that's brought about such good for the world. You've got to believe that sex is meaningful, that bodies are temples, that power should be used to serve. That there's a dignity to children, that there's a dignity to victims, that there are inviolable rights. All people are equal. You've got, you've got to believe all these th sort of things so that when it rises up within you that a little girl is worth everything, when that rises up within you, that everything, that's your Christianity talking. And the crucial thing is you cannot get this from a naturalistic framework. No. You cannot get this from a world in which only evolution is operative. You and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's honor one another's sexual boundaries at all times. <laughs> no, no, yes, yesterday, it doesn't work. I saw this, uh, you know, like on the, uh, on. I guess TikTok sort of figures out what you what you're interested in over time, and so TikTok <laughs> and and Reels have figured out that I I like to watch you know animal videos, and one of the videos that came up yesterday was these. I guess they're macaques, and they were just kind of sitting around and they're eating some fruit, and they they each got a baby. It was like a, a couple of mothers with their babies, and the babies sort of venture out into the middle area and they try to get some of the fruit for themselves, and then the one one mother who's like, "No, this is my kid's fruit. It's not your kid's fruit." She just kind of shoves the other baby, you know, across the <laughs> across the rock, and then the uh, other mother goes at her, and they just start a total squabble fest. At some point, they're like trying to rip a, they're almost like trying to rip one of the babies in half, and you know, thankfully it gets away. I guess if it had happened, it wouldn't have made it on on TikTok. But the behavior exhibited there. You know, we look at that, we say, that's what animals do. But in a naturalistic way of looking at the world, those are our close relatives. You know, these are, we're mischievous apes too. We just can build a few more ingenious contraptions, but there's no way, no reason we shouldn't behave that way unless we're more than that. Unless that's not just, you know, that's not a total account of the world. Yeah. And so, I mean, I mean, sometimes traditional Christians, I'm a, you know, traditional Christian. <laughs> sometimes we've been the worst because we, we've, we've tried to, we've tried to look to nature and talk about what's natural when it comes to sex and sexuality. And I think some, some of our opponents on the other side of some of these ideological wars about sex will point to any number of species, <laughs> which if we were to adopt their sexual practices, <laughs> we'd find ourselves in jail pretty quickly. <laughs> so. <laughs> So th there are Christians who want to look to nature and, and we'll find like one species that sort of mates monogamously for life. And <laughs> we'll go, ah, isn't that sweet? <laughs> well, th well, that's not what the old philosophers meant by natural law. Like, like C.S. Lewis says, we don't mean the law of the jungle. We mean the law of human nature, not, you know, yes. animal nature. But <laughs> Yes. And I mean, Joseph Henrik sort of says, you know, like uh, among, among all apes uh, of a certain standing, you know, who, who among them have monogamous pair bonding? Zero, you know. But then, even among human societies, how many have monogamous pair bonding for life? Close to zero. So, ev even within human societies, there has been a layering of culture that has determined for us what we think of as natural. And that's, that's very interesting to wrestle with. It's, there's been a layering of culture, and it's been to one degree or another of faithfulness to Jesus' teaching. It has been a layering of Jesus' kind of culture. 
on our natural proclivities and inclinations and intuitions that now is what we think of as natural. But take away that Christian teaching and it's, it's not as universal as, as we like to make out. We're so Christian, Glenn, that our perception of animals changes. People, when they, um, you know, actually get it, they're so used to Disney, right? They're so used to the way that animals behave in, in sort of entertainment that they have these, they have these Christian values, right? The animals behave like Christians. They think that they should protect the weak and care for the oppressed and downtrodden and so forth. But we get into the real wild and, you know, we, we, we expect them to behave this way and they, don't behave this way. Turns out that buffalo at Yellowstone is going to launch you into the stratosphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like just happened, what, yeah. last week with that lady? Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe I should be careful about Googling that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it happens sort of historically as well, you know, like Disney's version of Hercules or Ridley Scott's version of Gladiator <laughs> is through incredibly Christian lenses, you know. Marvel's version of Thor with the original Thor movie. I, one of my colleagues likes to talk about this, that that is the least Norse Odin ever portrayed <laughs> in entertainment. He's basically God the father. <laughs> he values compassion and restraint and w wise rule and so forth. He's not a power hungry maniac who wants to fill up his army for, uh, you know, Ragnarok at Valhalla. Yeah, one what, what of the values I, I would have loved to have added to the seven would be a, a discussion of heroism and how Christianity completely sort of shaped how we see heroes from the ancient world to, you know, coming through the sort of the, the Knights of the Round Table and in, into the, the modern Marvel universe. It's, we've, it's, it's been transformed out of all recognition. Yeah. You could really do that. There's, there's several more values that we haven't gotten to, Glenn, um, and we won't, but one of the kind of genius aspects of the book, I think, is this play you run on your readers where you'll say, in essence, you know, you get these values from Christianity. Christians haven't always lived up to these values, but the story that you're now telling yourself about the triumph of something better, more enlightened, more progressive, and more righteous than Christianity, that is itself a Christian story that no one would have told before. So, if you could give us kind of some examples of this, I, I immediately think of the Enlightenment one, the idea of the Dark Ages being succeeded by an age of, of dawning light and reason. T talk to us about how the, you know, people are playing themselves when they try to treat Christianity this way. Well, we've already mentioned Thomas Jefferson. I mean, it's just fascinating that, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that's We've been endowed by a creator with these unalienable rights. And, and again, the, the Christianity that has so infused him is, is invisible to him. And he, you know, he was a deist. And yet he, he thought that self-evident truth could deliver to him what had actually been imbibed by him over, over centuries of, of sort of Christian enculturation. He was somebody who also said that the priests fear the advent of science just as witches fear the dawning of the light, right? That's roughly the quote, so it's something like that. And, and, um, and it's just this, this idea of the world is turning, no matter what you do, you horrible priests who are always extinguishing the light, the light will come, enlightenment will dawn, the world will be remade, and you will flee shrieking into the shadows. And this is what science is doing. And so what's extraordinary about that is obviously it's a very biblical image of the, the light dawning and chasing away the shadows. People that walk in darkness have seen a great light. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Way back to Isaiah or you go to John 1 or, you know, Philippians 3. And, and there's all sorts of images of the, in the Bible, the true enlightenment happened 2000 years ago. It wasn't a sort of a 17th, 18th century thing. There, there was there was the world turning. There was, there was an epochal event in which someone took us from darkness to light. But it, it wasn't Protestants, Martin Luther, even though I'm a Protestant and I love Martin Luther. It, it wasn't Martin Luther who brought us from darkness into light. And it, and it wasn't Copernicus who, having put the sun at the center of the, the solar system, said, let there be light and there was enlightenment. And, you know, and it wasn't Immanuel Kant who first coined that phrase about enlightenment as a, as a you know, German or Prussian philosopher. But even the people like the Jeffersons of this world, 
saying that science has brought the dawning of the light. They cannot help but use a religious register in their, in their language, and they cannot help but have the priests playing the part of the baddies. Well, that's a very Christian thing, isn't it? It was the priests who handed Christ over to the Romans to be executed. It was the, the priests who were complicit in the execution of Christ. They wanted to extinguish the light. They did indeed. The religious authorities did indeed want to suppress the light and somehow shackle the sun. And, and yet the sun always rises and casts them into his shadow. And so even the way that we run away from the light, even the way that we run away from church just ends up being an incredibly Christian way of running away from it. And as I said uh, right at the beginning, the charges we bring against the church are charges that the church is unequal. <laughs> it is cruel and not compassionate. It is coercive and not consensual. It is unenlightened and not enlightened. It is anti-science and not pro-science. <laughs> it is restrictive and not free. It is regressive and not progressive. And at that stage, you just want to say, well, why, why, why should anything be equal, compassionate, consensual, enlightened, etc.? Why, why should anything be, be those things? You're, you're holding, well, because you're holding Jesus. the church. Because Jesus. Yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> for the longer answer, buy my book. But for the short answer, because Jesus. I mean, I, I love like Thomas Paine, you know, writing The Age of Reason. He, he talked about how the Middle Ages were this millennium of... of Deserts. It was this vast sandy desert with not a single shrub in view until the scientists and the, and the Enlightenment philosophers came about and, and they, they live in the sunny uplands and we have traversed. But what is he saying? You might say the promised land. So well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've traversed the wilderness. <laughs> well done, Moses Payne. You have brought us through the wilderness to the promised land. And, and even in rejecting the Bible, you cannot help but be biblical. That's the, I mean, that's just how immense Christianity is. Christi Christianity is so immense. Even our problems with Christianity have been given to us by Christianity. Yeah, this is where, you know, toward the end of uh, Tom Holland's book, he, he almost begins to mock secular readers who who just don't think that they're Christian. It's like he tells these stories and he, he'll throw those little phrases here and there and say, uh, yes, I, and again, the age of uh, of darkness and and turmoil and exile was ended and the people came back to the promised land to live. In, and it was just like, and again, we tell ourselves the Christian story that we just can't get away from, but we could in theory, get away from the Christian story. And this is where we take a very serious turn as we sort of land this conversation. Holland points to Nazi Germany as an obvious example of a real and true departure from that Christian story, one that sort of attempts to revive, it very consciously actually attempted to revive those, those pagan values, those pre-Christian values of strength triumphing over weakness. And Nietzsche sort of uh, advocates this a, a similar schema of, of values where Christianity is slave morality, right? That weakness needs to be purged from us. What does it look like, Glenn, for a society to give up the religious and supernatural underpinnings of their values and their commitments while trying to preserve those values and commitments? Can that continue indefinitely? What happens if we try that and where are we headed? I did a debate with Matt Dillahunty, who's sort of a, an anti-theist YouTuber um, with hundreds of millions of views on, on YouTube. And, and um, it was for the unbelievable show here in the UK. Justin Briley kind of hosts that. And we, one of the inspirations for the book that I've written was really my conversation with, with Matt Dillahunty. And he was just saying, well, we can just through reason and evidence leave behind whatever benefits Christianity may have given in the past. We're, we're much cleverer now and we can do without the superstition. Thank you very much. And interestingly, it was Justin Briley who brought up the Nazis and brought up eugenics and, and getting rid of the weak. And what was just fascinating to me was that Matt Dillahunty was, was kind of saying, look, you just need to look at the data, look at the evidence to see whether the the weak in your society should should live or not. And I was like, so you're saying they don't have value, they need to demonstrate value? He was like, yeah, yeah, they don't have value, they need to demonstrate their value. And we were sort of both pressing him at that at that stage. 
about, you know, well, at what stage can you actually have a just war? At what stage could you actually stop Hitler for what he's doing? You, it seems like you would have to have a symposium in which he put forward his case for the kind of economy that he wanted to build. And he found that eliminating the, the weak and the handicapped actually helped German society to fly. And, and I guess you'd have another person, you know, producing another set of papers and, 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 and you'd sort of vote on the outcome, would you? And, and like, is, is Hitler wrong because he, he fails to make the economic case for it? It, it, just, it just seems totally unworkable. But what's also unworkable is just making the Nazi comparison. You just can't keep on <laughs> making the Nazi comparison and just calling someone fascist. We're, we're just seeing that there's, uh, there's, there's inflation <laughs> when it comes to using fascist and it starts to lose its value. And if you start to label someone as a phobe or a bigot or a racist or a fascist, increasingly, what will stop people in the end saying, yes, I am, so what? What we're kind of surviving on at the moment is a memory of World War II. You know, World, World War II has been kind of our epic battle in which the Antichrist, Hitler, who totally inverted the value of equality and totally inverted the, the value of compassion and went, went about his genocide, he was Antichrist. And, you know, I guess in the popular mythology, the good guys won. And, and I'm very glad that the Allies won that victory, but it has displaced. The Christian story for, for 1900 years, the moral exempl exemplar for the West was Christ. Since World War II, the moral exemplar has become Hitler. We used to say, what did Jesus do? And we'll do that. Now we say, what did Hitler do? We'll do the opposite. But there's only so long you can, you can go where you're just inverting the inversion which is kind of what we're left with. You know, I'm, I'm here in the UK and, and after World War II, we just decided, let's not be Nazis. Let's have, you know, massive welfare state and, and you know, the NHS and let's just, let's not be Nazis, everybody. Let's not be Nazis. It's kind of like Google's guiding principle, you know, back in the day, don't be evil. It was just, don't be evil, don't be a Nazi and you'll be fine. Yeah. And, and, and what's interesting at the moment is it's not that we have lost our moral certainties. We're incredibly certain. In some senses, we're, we're <laughs> generations are coming up that are more certain about difficult moral issues and contested moral issues than anyone has been about anything <laughs> in the world. And we used to think that, you know, without God, everything is permissible, which is the old Dostoevsky line. But I think what we're realizing now is that without God, everything is preachy, really, really preachy, painfully so. And we are excommunicating one another. We're hurling Bible verses at one another. We've just forgotten the references. And we're flaming each other. We're excommunicating one another, which is what cancellation is. We're, we're trying to enlighten one another. We're trying to evangelize one another, which is what everyone's doing on social media the whole time. <laughs> yes. And it's incredibly fraught because you know, having taken God out of the, the central place in our discourse, politics rises up to first place. And then with that power vacuum, you've got entertainment and sports, which just, just used to be entertainment and sports, but now it's been elevated to become political and everything is heightened and everything is charged and everything is, is religious because without naming the religious and without giving ourselves on the Lord's day <laughs> to the Lord and, and engaging in the true and original picture of, of, you know, morality and truth and spirituality without, without that, it just gets smeared into all of life and everything becomes heightened. Everything becomes charged. But when you press beneath the propaganda, when you press beneath the slogans, we don't know why we shouldn't be fascist because natural, natural selection might suggest that you ought to be actually. Group selection works quite well under a fascistic regime. Why, why shouldn't you? And so it, it is an incredibly dangerous place where we are absolutely certain of, of moral truths. We're absolutely certain that the other guy's wrong. But when we're pressed, we don't know why. We're in a castle in the air, six miles high, <laughs> with nothing under our feet. A, king, a kingdom without a king is the phrase. Yeah you use. Yeah. Yeah. I stole that from Mark Sayers. I'm sure he stole that from somebody else, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> nothing's original. It's all, it's all the air we breathe, but 
yeah, that's the that's the that's the position we're in. And so my plea really at the end is to to my secular friends is you don't have to take a leap of faith. You are already midair. History has taken a ginormous leap of faith. What you really need is some ground beneath your feet, and only Jesus will do. That's fantastic. The appeal at the end of the book is what in many ways sets this apart as well. Because obviously, you know, Tom Holland is an atheist and he's making this, you know, very similar historical argument. He ends it with a big question mark. It's just sort of like, well, where do we go from here? Can these values continue to sustain themselves without Christianity? And he very much leaves the question open. Whereas you make a pretty, you make a pretty strong stand that no, the values cannot maintain themselves without the supernatural origin story that gave rise to them. And as soon as, like you said, someone comes along and challenges them, we're going to find out we're standing on nothing. We're like the, you know, the uh, coyote in the, in the Looney Tunes cartoon when he looks down and realizes he's stepped off the cliff and he's just hanging in midair. That's where we are. Or as, uh, you know, Os Guinness likes to say, we're a cut flower civilization. We may look pretty for the time being with our values, but eventually those are, are going to shrivel. And I like the, you know, the posture that you strike at the end where it's, it's not an appeal to believe something that you don't already believe. And in many ways, it is, it is an appeal to justify what you already believe and to seriously consider Christianity as the justification for that. And I thought it was a, a really unique approach to the sort of Christian, the Christian instincts that we have. I am a huge fan of C.S. Lewis, but the thing about Lewis is that he's been dead for a long time. And as relevant as much of what he wrote is still, his appeal, I think, is much more to the rational, secular, sort of mid-century mind. He, he wasn't appealing as much to the rambunctiously moralistic, unforgiving, condemning social justice crusader mindset that, that we have today. And this book does appeal to that person and asks them to, uh, challenges them to ask themselves some very serious questions. And so, I like the way you really end that. It, tell me um, real quickly before we finish up here, Glenn, you've got these three categories of people. I'll let you kind of summarize the categories and then uh, tell us where you land with each of them. So I talk about the, uh, the what do I say? The nuns, uh, the duns, and the ones. And I, I, I do what every marketing person tells you not to do. I sort of aim my book at everybody because there's literally nobody left once you have those three categories. But the, the, the nuns are the N-O-N-E-S's, those who on a survey when they're asked, do you have a religion? They say none. Uh, I have no religion. And uh, to them, I just want to say, don't be so sure you're an unbeliever. You believe in all sorts of stuff, and I hope to have, I hope to have shown you that Jesus is the source of those things. Don't be left with this pale imitation of the kingdom without the king, because the king really does embody these values. He really is compassion on legs, and uh, you got to meet him. You got to meet him. And I recommend that people read the gospels and 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 encounter kind of the the quintessence of these values because like at the end of the day values values right it's kind of we we need the person who embodies them and we need a person who can forgive us for failing at the values because that's that's the really spicy unhelpful dreadful thing about the culture wars is that we we are just we are not in a realm of forgiveness uh, we're just in a realm of moral certainties and othering and the, you know, excommunication. And well, of course, because values, values cannot forgive you. They can only judge you. But come to the Christ who embodies these values because he can actually forgive you when you fail them because we all fail them. And then the second category is the, the duns, maybe the deconstructing or those who've walked away from faith or those who had a history uh, in the church, or perhaps they went to church school, and, and now they they figure that Christianity is in the rearview mirror. And again, I'm just saying, don't be so sure. And can you please press into the reason why you think you're done with Christianity? Can you please notice where you're standing as you make your accusation? Because I want to stand with you and turn and, you know, one one Peter... Tell, tells us that judgment begins with the household of God, right? And I want to stand with you in bringing prophetic critique to the people of God. But I also want you to look at where we're both standing as we do that, because we are standing on profoundly Christian truths and, and it doesn't make sense without Jesus. And I tell some stories about people who have 
walked that journey. And then in terms of the ones, the W-O-Ns, those who have been won by the love of Jesus, Christians, uh, really for them, uh, A, I want people to see that Jesus really is Lord of all. He's Lord of the world. He's Lord of history. Things are unfolding just as he said they would. The gates of hell are not prevailing against the church. The church is plundering the kingdom of darkness and is going out to the nations. And it's incredibly exciting and improbable and amazing. But my final word to the church is really be weird. I know that we, according to Joseph Henrik, are Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, but be properly weird. You know, the whole world believes in this generic sense of equality, but will you really practice that equality in your churches and in your life? I know that we notionally believe in looking after the weak, but will you actually look after the widow and the orphan and the sojourner? Will we actually embody these things? Because I think the church has been potent precisely where it has been peculiar. And it is when we have lived out our right side up kind of kingdom values in the midst of a world that goes in the opposite direction. That, that is precisely where the revolution has known another reverberation. It has known another aftershock. And that might be a surprising thing because people might think, ah, Glenn's thesis is the world is quite like the church, so the church should be quite like the world. <laughs> and it's the very opposite. I, th- I think the, on- the only reason why any of the Christian revolution has gotten out into the world is when the church has been really weird, really distinctive, really different. So, so be weird is my final, my final uh, exhortation. Well, outstanding. My guest today has been Glenn Scrivener, poet, priest, Australian, author of the new book, The Air We Breathe, How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress, and Equality. Glenn, thanks so much for this terrific conversation. Thank you, Shane. 